Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching Top 10's Net, and in the video today, we're looking at the top 10 apocalyptic facts about the Earth's greatest mass extinction. Humanity's rise to become the dominant species on the planet seems to have been a fairly orderly progression from one species to another. But this could not be further from the truth. It was more like an arbitrary, often brutal process, a sort of survive-or-die situation. Since life began on our planet about 4 billion years ago, Earth has gone through a series of ups and downs in terms of its living creatures. So much so that 99% of all beings that have ever existed are now gone. The planet went through five or six major events where more than half of its inhabitants were extinguished, with another series of smaller ones taking place now and again. Their causes are somewhat varied, but we'll be focusing on the greatest mass extinction that has ever taken place here on Earth. It happened some 252 million years ago during the Permian period, and paved the way for the Triassic one. Also known as the Great Dying, the planet witnessed a huge cataclysmic event so devastating that 75% of all land creatures and over 95% of all marine life went extinct. What caused it, what exactly happened, and what we can learn from it is what we'll be looking at in today's video. Number 10. The Permian Period In order to properly understand what happens back then, we first need to look at the Permian Period itself. It lasted for about 47 million years, from 299 up to 252 million years ago, and was part of the larger Paleozoic Era. By the beginning of this period, all current continents were pushed together and formed a single large supercontinent known as Pangaea. Life in the interior of this huge continent was harsh, as it had a much cooler cooler, drier climate than around its coast. Fern-like plants and forests, which dominated the previous Carboniferous period, began to give way to the first seed-bearing plants, the gymnosperms, which in turn evolved to present-day conifers, cycads, and ginkgos. Two types of land animal began to evolve during this time, the synapsids and the sauropsids. The first, which seemed to be the dominant of the two, or at least at the beginning, were the ancestors of all present-day mammals. In the later part of the Permian period, these evolved into therapsids, with some of them exhibiting evidence of of whiskers and a possible indication of fur. Sorapsids, on the other hand, went on to become the reptiles, birds, and dinosaurs that would follow the Permian. Insects began to diversify, with cicadas and beetles making their appearance at this time. Marine life is a bit harder to identify, as there is little exposed fossil evidence available. Nevertheless, the shallower coastal waters around Pangaea indicate that reefs were large and diverse ecosystems with numerous sponge and coral species. Bony fish began to make their presence felt, while sharks and rays continued to multiply as they've done for millennia. Life in all its prehistoric shapes and sizes seemed to be stable, with evolution following its normal path. But then something happened, something that would shake the entire course of evolution from its very core. Number 9. A Massive Earth-Shaking Eruption Many have speculated that the trigger for all these species to simply die off was a meteorite slamming into the Earth, similar to the one that may have wiped out the dinosaurs millions of years later. According to the evidence, however, this seems not to have been the case. Since fossil records don't indicate a sudden and all-round extinction, like the one you would see with an asteroid impact, paleontologists have come to the conclusion that something else was the cause, and that the cause can still be seen in modern-day Siberia. Hidden below the Arctic tundra lies one of the world's largest expanses of lava flows, forming a bleak landscape known as the Siberian Traps. What happens back then can only be described as a huge supervolcanic eruption, the likes of which have not been seen on Earth for over 500 million years. During the Permian period, Siberia was located at the northern part of Pangaea, and when the volcano erupted, it engulfed an area roughly the size of the United States, almost 1.7 million square miles. This area was covered with a one-mile-deep sea of molten rock. Today, only about 500,000 square miles of it are still visible. Evidence suggests that there wasn't a big explosion, but a long, ongoing flow of lava which spread for millions of square miles in a process which lasted for maybe half a million years or more. And now, even if these immense lava flows may have killed anything in their path over a large area of land, it still doesn't account for the greatest mass extinction in Earth's history. What came after it, however, did manage to do the job. Number 8. First came acid rain. Besides the tremendous amount of ash and dust that came from an eruption such as this, there was also a huge quantity of sulfur dioxide, 
a gas that has a huge negative impact on the environment. This gas rose high up into the atmosphere, where it condensed into tiny droplets. If mixed with water, however, you get sulfuric acid. It is estimated that the air in the northern hemisphere of this ancient Earth had a pH level so low it was comparable to undiluted lemon juice in its acidity. Evidence shows that within the first year after the eruption, the volcano was able to produce about 1.46 billion tons of sulfur dioxide, enough to completely devastate the northern half of the world. Around 4,000 billion tons of sulfur dioxide may have escaped Siberia in total. Now, back in 1783, Iceland experienced a similar volcano and subsequent lava flows, but they were incomparable in size, around Mount Lackey. After the eruption, people reported their eyes burning, impossibility of breathing, livestock suffocating, and suffering lesions and burning of their skin, with plant life getting the worst of it. The same thing happened around 252 million years ago, but at a much, much larger scale. The whole food chain began to collapse as acid rain was burning plants and animals alike. These toxic gases also created some chemical reactions that destroyed the overall protective ozone layer to levels lower than those observed in the Antarctic ozone hole in the 1990s. Number 7. Then came a volcanic winter. Some of it remained in the atmosphere, way above rain-forming clouds and as minute sulfuric acid droplets. These reflected sunlight away from the planet, cooling its surface. Combined with the insane amount of ash and dust which quickly encircled the globe by high stratospheric winds, the planets began to witness an abrupt drop in all-round temperatures. The same thing happened in Iceland in 1783. Here, the cooling was catastrophic as it killed more people than the acid rain and the volcano combined. For a period of two or three years, much of northern Europe reported crop failures, death, and unrest as a result. The infamous French Revolution started because of it. In a virtual simulation made on the last eruption at Yellowstone some 640,000 years ago, ash and dust completely covered the northern hemisphere in just one month's time and dropped temperatures in 18 months by 10 degrees Celsius. This blanket brought on a quick rise in Arctic ice, reflecting even more of the sun back into space. Rain stopped falling altogether, with the oceans and land retaining more CO2. This made food supplies last for only weeks in some areas. It took the planet 20 years to come back to its pre-eruption temperature. But our eruption from 252 million years ago was 1,600 times larger than this one and lasted for over half a million years. The winter itself certainly didn't last as long, but it most certainly sent global temperatures plummeting for decades, if not centuries. With the food chain in disarray, 10% of the world's species had perished by this point. Number 6. Quickly followed by a massive global warming. All the while the dust settled, our supervolcano continued on pumping lava over the landscape, as well as tons and tons of CO2 into the air. Fossil records from the time following the eruption indicate a sudden rise of carbon in the atmosphere. Scientists calculate that CO2 levels during this eruption were 20 times higher than they are today, and more than enough to seriously affect the planet. It was a sort of global warming on steroids. In 10,000 years, the volcano released 24,000 gigatons of carbon into the atmosphere, and temperatures spiked by more than 5 degrees Celsius. However much 24,000 gigatons sounds like, if divided by the time it took to be released, it comes down to only 2.4 gigatons per year. We currently emit slightly over four times that, about 10 gigatons, with even more being foreseen to be pumped out in the future. While this 5 degree increase doesn't seem like that much to us, it had some seriously devastating effects on the climate. In equatorial regions, it simply stopped raining and lush forests became scorched deserts. If these regions were least affected by the previous volcanic winter, the massive global warming that followed severely changed that. This is the time when the last of the Permian herbivores, as well as 35% of all land life, perished. And if things looked like they couldn't get any worse, well, they did. This rapid global warming unleashed a deadly chain reaction, but this time it happened in the oceans. Number 5. Leading to the oceans turning to acid from above All while extinction ruled over the lands above the surface, nature was brewing an even more atrocious fate for the oceans. Life here remains mostly unscathed by the previous apocalyptic events, but things were about to take a turn for the worse. The much, much, much worse. All throughout this time, the oceans were absorbing about half of the CO2 from the air, similar to what it's doing today. 
Scientists have deduced that over the course of the previously mentioned 10,000 years during the eruption, the pH levels in the ocean dropped by 0.6 to 0.7 units. By comparison, modern ocean pH levels have fallen by 0.1 pH units since the Industrial Revolution, a 30% increase in acidity. Depending on the future trend of carbon dioxide emissions, this value could fall by another 0.3 to 0.4 units by the end of this century, which will bring us extremely close to what happened 252 million years ago. And what happened was disastrous for all marine life. As CO2 combines with water, it turns into carbonic acid. In seawater, this acid can have some really negative effects on the formation of carbonous minerals, the ones that mussels, corals, sea urchins, and plankton use to make their shells. As the acidity grew, these marine species died off, and with them, the whole marine food chain system collapsed. Scorpion-like predators called eryptorids to various types of trilobites, as well as all shell-forming beings, died off because of this event. Some other, less resistant marine species were also extinguished. Matthew Clarkson, a geochemist at the University of Otago in New Zealand, said that it took life another 5 million years to diversify once more. Number 4. And oxygen depleted from below. As marine life was being killed by the growing water acidity, an equally devastating killer was rising from the depths. With temperatures surging worldwide, so did the water. This in turn led to the oxygen-depleted waters from the ocean floor to expand and rise to the surface. Not being allowed to sink to greater depths due to suffocation, fish and invertebrates were stuck between a rock and a hard place, dying en masse as a result. Evidence of this was found in Greenland by paleontologist Paul Wignall from the University of Leeds, where the ancient seabed, now raised, shows a sign of a large amount of fool's gold, pyrite. This element can only be created if there is no oxygen around. Evidence of this rising, oxygen-depleted water can be seen today. As the oceans warm up, less oxygen is carried in the water, thus leaving the ocean sequestered in layers. Already naturally low in oxygen, these deep regions keep growing, spreading horizontally and vertically. Vast portions of the eastern Pacific, almost all of the Bay of Bengal, parts near Central America and an area of the Atlantic off West Africa as broad as the United States, are such dead zones. Since 1965, these low oxygen areas have expanded by more than 1.7 million square miles. Further studies have indicated that during the Permian extinction, this low oxygen in the waters halted recovery in the oceans by at least 1 million years. Number 3. With water turning pink and poisonous as a result. Besides no oxygen, fool's gold also needs hydrogen sulfide, H2S, to be produced. And according to the large amounts of it found all over the world and dating from that period, it is evident that the oceans were full of the stuff. In order to get that much H2S into the water, however, something drastic must have happened. As temperatures rose, ocean currents stopped and water became low in oxygen. Once this occurred, organisms which hate oxygen began to thrive. The purple sulfur bacteria is one such organism. Organism. Often found in stagnant water, these bacteria have a waste product, H2S, which is poisonous to all air-breathing life. With the rise of oxygen-depleted waters, so did the environment for this organism grow, resulting in the poisoning of the entire Permian Ocean. There was so much H2S in the water that, if seen from space, the ocean would have looked pink in areas where it now looks green, due to the large number of bacteria present. But besides its aesthetics, some scientists believe that there was so much toxic gas produced, it could no longer be contained in seawater solution. As a result, large oily bubbles of hydrogen sulfide came out of the pink-stained sea and entered the atmosphere, with some truly devastating results. Besides poisoning the few remaining plants and animals at the surface, H2S also significantly added to the shrinking of the ozone layer. Number 2. And then came the final blow. At this point, almost all marine life was gone. It was the closest our planet ever came to achieving an aquatic extinction such as this. Land life, on the other hand, was only halfway there. What caused the other 25% to die was another subsequent heat wave. This time, however, it didn't come from the volcano itself, but rather the depths of the ocean. And CO2 wasn't to blame this time either, but rather methane. 
Methane is 25 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2, and there is currently an estimated 30 trillion tons of methane hydrate locked in the ocean floor. If, for any reason, water temperatures rise, this methane is released, as it is ultra-sensitive to heat and flows to the surface in the form of bubbles. This, in turn, will heat up the planet even further, leading to even more methane escaping in a sort of positive feedback cycle. This is exactly what happened 252 million years ago, killing off the remainder of the land animals and plants that were fortunate enough to escape the previous cataclysms. Earth's temperature rose by another 5 degrees Celsius as a result. Even though it took the Siberian traps more than 10,000 years to reach this point, we today have begun to experience this phenomenon. As of 2014, researchers have found more than 500 bubbling methane vents being activated off the U.S. east coast alone. There are an estimated 30,000 other such hidden methane vents worldwide. While this methane doesn't reach the surface yet, it is, however, dissolved into the ocean at depths of hundreds of meters, and it's being oxidized to CO2, which leads to further acidification of the water. Number 1. The Aftermath Huge catastrophes such as this one can reset the evolutionary clock, meaning that the whole course of evolution will change. As the dominant species disappear, less significant ones take their place. As Gorgonopsians died off due to the scorching heat and hunger, the smaller Cynodonts took their place. Since these creatures burrowed underground, it offered them protection from both their dying predators as well as the harsh climate outside. After the mass extinction was over, and over the course of millions upon millions of years, these Cynodonts went on to become one of the dominant species of the New World. Without them, we, as well as other mammals, wouldn't be here today. Understanding what happened at the end of the Permian can help us tremendously in dealing with our current anthropogenic extinction. As we have observed up to this point, we are presently experiencing many of the effects felt millions of years ago, but which take place at a much faster pace than they did back then. For the first time in Earth's history, the dominant species on the planet is upsetting the delicate balance of its ecosystem. Our massive production of CO2 has had a catastrophic impact on Earth's system, and we are able to shorten the time from tens of thousands to years to mere centuries, some of which have already passed. Many will say that this is just a way for the planet to reboot itself in terms of life. It happened before, so it can happen again, right? Well, not necessarily. While it is true that we are the result of the Permian extinction, as well as the others that followed, this doesn't automatically mean that life will happen again if Earth goes through another massive die-off. Venus is one such example. Even if it never had life, at one point in its evolution, these two planets were quite similar. But since Venus is closer to the Sun, it was a bit warmer. Because of this, our sister planet went through a process known as runaway global warming, which made it into the hellish place that it is today. Its closer proximity to the Sun was just the catalyst it needed to ignite this global warming, which, after four billion years, is still going on. Are we really that proud as to put all life we currently know exists into such a dangerous and risky predicament? So I really hope you found that video interesting and informative. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Also, over there on the right are a couple of other videos that you might enjoy if you enjoyed this one. And thank you for watching.